Welcome back to lecture one, part three, pain throughout the organ systems. We'll get right on this, starting talking about uh, types of acute pain. So somatic and visceral are two of those words that I tend to link together in my head and remember one and the other is the other. I can remember that visceral means deep, as in the visceral organs. So if visceral means deep in the body, then the other one, somatic, must be the one that is superficial. As far as pain sensation goes, it's hard for us to really pinpoint exactly where pain is if it's deep in our bodies. So we say that it's poorly localized. On the other hand, the superficial somatic pain can be either poorly localized or it can be very sharp and well localized. An example of sharp, well localized pain would be when we get blood and they have to stick that little pin in our fingertip to check our iron level. Is it just me or does that hurt like crazy? An itch in your back would be a good example of a dull and poorly localized pain, even though it might be a stretch to call an itch pain. You ever notice where as soon as you scratch the spot, it seems to have moved over a bit? Anyway, the last one, referred pain, refers to other places. Some of them make sense, but others like the liver and gallbladder manifest pain in strange places like the neck. It would probably be worth a few minutes of your time to get to know some of these unusual locations that pain can refer to because you'll be able to make a diagnosis when pain isn't where you think it was. Okay, let's change gears here a bit and look specifically at chest pain. Costochondritis, angina pectoralis, and myocardial infarctions are three common reasons for chest pain that often get confused with one another. If you had to pick one of these reasons for your chest pain, which would you prefer? Which would you really rather not have? Let's look at costochondritis first. This is a sharp pain in the chest that may seem just like a heart attack. Immediately, we should notice that it's an inflammation of some kind because its name ends in itis. Then we can look at the costal part, and that should tell us that it has something to do with the ribs. Lastly, the chondral part refers to cartilage, and so we have an inflammation of the cartilage of the ribs. Although we might not know exactly what caused it in many cases, we, knew, we do know that since it's an itis, we can probably treat it with an anti-inflammatory drug like ibuprofen. Oh, and, and don't forget rest. How do you differentiate these from a heart attack? That we'll talk about in class. These next two slides are just here for your reference because we're about to start talking about problems in the heart that have to do with clogging coronary arteries. Likely that you're already familiar with the basic coronary vessels, but a little review never hurts. Some of the big ones like the left coronary artery, you should definitely know and, and realize how much of the heart that thing takes. <clears throat> While costochondritis is a come and go kind of condition resulting in, in chest pain, angina pectoralis is a, is a little more serious. I like to think about this as a pre-heart attack because frequently the cause of angina pectoralis is those conditions that eventually will lead to a heart attack, high amounts of arterial blockage being one of the most common reasons. This will slow blood flow and temporarily cut it off if an arterial plaque gets too large, especially in the left coronary artery of the heart. Patients feel a sudden severe chest pain, complete with the elephant on my chest, squeezing and pressure sensation, but it only lasts a short time, like three to five minutes. Then it lessens up as the arteries dilate to allow more blood flow. In many cases, the patient, usually male, just writes the episode off to indigestion and continues on with whatever they were doing. What they should be doing is going to the doctor and changing their lifestyle to prevent having a heart attack down the road. So you can read these signs and symptoms on your own. The doctor will probably start with an EKG to see if a heart attack really happened or not. With angina pectoralis, the EKG may be normal, so maybe a stress test. 
is the next. Um, this is when we take the guy and toss him on a treadmill and see if we can make him have another excruciatingly painful episode. College and med school, $200,000. Provoking a heart attack, or near heart attack, and Mr. Fatty, priceless. Okay, what else can we do to actually see what's going on in there? An angiogram is always nice. Basically, we inject some dye into the coronary arteries, and no, I don't know which kind, and see where it stops. That'll tell us where the blockage is and how bad it is. If you click on the link in this PowerPoint, it'll take you to more information about an angiogram. Um, from the NIH, National Institutes of Health. Before we do all this, however, we can get a pretty good idea of what's happening with a complete blood test or CBC, um, a cholesterol test, and measuring CRP or C-reactive protein. The CRP isn't specific for any particular condition, but it does tell us if there's some type of inflammation happening somewhere in the body. Are you awake? What was the C-reactive protein again? Correct. It indicates inflammation somewhere in the body. Another useful test is the ESR or erythrocyte sedimentation rate. It also indicates that there's inflammation somewhere in the body. Specifically, the ESR or SED rate measures how fast red blood cells settle to the bottom of the test tube in an hour. Inflammation causes some proteins to make these red blood cells stick together, form a big glob, and then sink faster to the bottom. A high ESR can lead us to think about possible infection, uh, autoimmune diseases, or even cancer. Um, more about ESR at uh, webmd.com. You should be able to click on that. The picture, by the way, is different than what I show in class. I think that is Dr. Premack's wife, if I'm not mistaken, but I'm not positive about that. He put that in here. Okay, so. Now we're on the big MI, or myocardial infarction, or heart attack. To be classified as an MI, there has to actually be damage to the myocardium or muscle tissue of the heart. This is caused by ischemia, or lack of oxygen to the tissue for a long enough time period to kill it. We break MIs into two general categories, subendocardial and transmural. The first, subendocardial, is less damaged than the full transmural because only the tissue directly below the endocardium is involved. Hopefully you remember your anatomy. In any case, transmural MI is defined as when the damage goes completely through the layers of the heart and even includes the epicardium or outside layer. Which type of heart attack happened in each of these pictures? Transmural. See how those three arrows point to three separate layers of the heart? And subendocardial, just that middle layer. I know it looks worse than the other one, but we're talking about the layers here. All right, that seems like a good place to, to stop. So let's uh, stop right there. We'll pick it up next time.